Det er ikke det, det Men det er det er det Det er det, man er ikke det er det jo egentlig. Er det ikke Det er det Altså det er ikke mit, det er jeg synes det er meget fedt. Ja, jeg er pisselig glad den. Der er ingenting der, ingenting. Det er okay, det er det Det er så er det det er 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 det to talk just about what you say now. Um, it would be good to discuss perhaps also, uh, so how do you do education around these issues? So anything that's on your mind, please think about that while you listen, and while you have coffee and cake, and we'll have a nice uh, discussion and conversation afterwards. So we'll run until four. Okay? Great. Uh, I don't think Adam Greenfield needs much of an introduction to this crowd, um, but uh, I will leave it to you anyway. Just to say. Okay, thanks, man. <laughs> um, thanks so much for having me here today. It's it's a, a genuine pleasure for me to be here. 
Um, a little bit intimidating for me, not because I'm unused to facing audiences of this size, but because of the specific way in which this auditorium stacks you up with like this <laughs> gigantic murder board of people facing me. Um, so, hi. Um, my name is Adam Greenfield, and I'm from New York City. And um, my most sincere apologies to those of you who saw this talk yesterday. Um, I, each talk is you know, even from the same deck, they're always a little bit different. You always riff on different things or remember different stories to tell. But I'm afraid that it won't be sufficiently different and distinct from yesterday's presentation for those of you who saw it to, to really, um, you know, knock your socks off. So, I, you know, I will not be offended if you sneak out midway through and, and go check your email or something or, or manage to check your email from where you're sitting. Um, yeah, the talk is called Another City is Possible the smart city from above and below. And, and what it is, is a way of engaging uh, and problematizing and pushing back against and hopefully ultimately transcending the rhetoric around what we are called, or what we are told the smart city is. Um, I run a design studio called Urban Scale in New York City. And Urban Scale is the outgrowth of you know, it's now about 14 years of my investment in the field of, of technology, user-centered design for technological systems, services, and interfaces. Um, and what I've realized in the course of this effort, uh, starting in the Bay Area in 1998, moving to Tokyo in 2000, um, moving back to New York City in the mid-2000s, finally moving to Finland in 2008, um, what I've begun to, uh, to realize and, and wanted to assert on the world stage is that our cities are now complex enough organisms that they require interface thinking into and unto themselves. We need to think about how to design interfaces to all of the potentials and opportunities that are latent in our great urban complexes on Earth. Um, and this is not a body of thought that's particularly well developed. So uh, when I left Nokia in 2010, I went off uh, precisely with the intention of putting my money where my mouth is, starting my own practice, and seeing if the ideas that I had spent the last decade or so working through intellectually could be expressed in the form of commerce. Um, because for better or for worse, and I do kind of think it's for worse, um, our civilization doesn't really recognize ideas until they're expressed in the form of commerce and successful commerce at that. So. <clears throat> If you want your ideas to have traction, it can sometimes be very beneficial to wrap them up in an envelope of a value-added product or service and see if people will buy it. And that was part of the intention, part of the rhetorical strategy behind Urban Scale. As I've mentioned, Urban Scale works in the domain uh, that is very, very frequently referred to as the smart city. Um, a place where uh, networked digital information systems and services are brought to bear on all of the objects, surfaces, and relations of a city. So not merely the built environment, not merely urban form, but metropolitan experience as well. All of the things that we do in the course of living the city, all of the spaces that we encounter, and the places that we make in the course of having urban experiences, all of these things bound together and infiltrated decisively by network digital information processing, information gathering, information visualization, action taken upon information that's drawn up into the network and brought back off of the network. All of this is wrapped up in this rhetoric around what is now being called the smart city. But there's a point that I always try to make about the smart city anytime the idea comes up. I, I, I do a lot of consulting around the world and I speak to a lot of municipal administrations. Bless you. I speak to a lot of municipal administrations and uh, you know they say, well we want Taipei to be a smart city or we want you know Cleveland, Ohio to be a smart city. Everybody wants to be a smart city. And the thing that I'm at pains to point out to these municipal administrators is that a smart city, after all, is still a city. It's a very particular kind of terrain to operate upon. It has its own constraints, it has its own unique um, implications for the design of network systems. Um, so we have an advantage coming into this terrain, asserting that we want to operate on this terrain, which is that we can take advantage of 7,000 years of human thought about placemaking 
and urban structuration and development. We can take advantage of a very, very long heritage of some of the most um, painstaking and granular thinkers that humanity has ever produced about exactly how it is that places come to be and produce value and meaning for the people who live, work, and dream in them. Uh, there's no reason to approach this you know, as an abstract problem. It's not at all an abstract problem. It's the very de definition of a situated and a grounded problem domain. And that's why I would want to refer back not so much to the history or the trajectory of technology, but to the history and trajectory of urbanist thought in all of the work that I do. Um, and in this, uh, I, I read a lot of books. I, I just, you know, I, I, that's, that's the way that I learn. I read a lot. And one of my favorite books that I've encountered in the last several years um, is an absolutely tremendous volume that I recommend to all of you. It's called Seeing Like a State by James C. Scott. Um, in this book, in Seeing Like a State, Scott argues that there, in the history of urbanist thinking, there, there are two predominant modes for thinking about how places are created, how places are built up over time, and how they're experienced by the people who live in them. Um, and he would argue that um, these two ways of thinking about cities are, are the master modes of thought. And he associates them with two characteristic thinkers. The first is a top-down approach that he associates with this guy. Uh, this is the famous Swiss modernist architect and urbanist Le Corbusier, which you may be familiar with. Um, an astonishingly influential architect operating in the first part of the 20th century, um, whose impact wasn't really felt until the latter half of the 20th century, and in a great many ways is still being dealt with. Uh, Le Corbusier was appalled by the medieval European city. Uh, he thought of it as a breeding ground for disease, uh, a, a sink of filth, you know, kind of a catchment basin for all of the dirt and corruption of the world, a place where um, conspiracy bred, a place where, where revolution would foment, and, and a revolution that in some senses was justified because the material environment was so incredibly ugly and detrimental in his point of view. And uh, he thought that, that things were so irremediably broken in the medieval European city he had to impose an entirely new order on things to fix things and clarify them. And this was his solution. This was something called the Vie Radieuse, which I'm pretty sure dates from around 1923. Um, in this image, this was a projected um, master plan for Paris. Um, Paris, which, mind you, had already been decisively reworked by Baron Haussmann uh, a century earlier, um, precisely to open up ghetto neighborhoods to imperial control, precisely to drive boulevards through the city, which were not at all for the purpose of providing people with lovely promenades to experience you know, the early leafing of the trees in springtime, but which were precisely about the ability to rapidly and efficiently move militarized police forces to working class neighborhoods to control riots and, and, and uprisings that began there. This was the lesson of the revolution in, in Paris. Um, so, so Paris is already a terrain that's been reworked for the needs of control. But Le Corbusier comes along and he wants to take that tendency to its maximum conclusion. He wants to drive everything subordinated brutally to this really um, incredibly painstakingly detailed visual order, this optical order, an order that um, is precisely about the segregation of residential from commercial from industrial and further the separation of the processes and systems of circulation support those things from those functions. So in the image that you see here, these are residential tower blocks. This is a residential district. You see that um, automotive traffic has been segregated from foot traffic. Um, and you see that the whole thing has this pleasingly crisp grid-like order to it. Um, it is a high modernist vision of places. And I will confess to you that personally, I find high modernism deeply appealing. My personal aesthetic is a high modernist aesthetic. I live in a brutalist, modernist tower block, and I love it, and I get a great deal of pleasure out of it every day when I go home. But the fact of the matter is <clears throat> that, just statistically speaking, most people do not. Most people do find that to be what it is said to be by its critics, alienating and cold and sterile and anti-human. 
I personally feel just the opposite, but I'm only, you know, a tiny seed blowing on the wind. It, it happens to be the case that most human beings do not find this kind of environment particularly appealing. But there is a population of human beings to which this model of things has always been deeply appealing, however, and that is the authoritarian personality of the administrator. This is the uh, master plan of Priscilla, the capital city of Brazil. The Cabousier himself was not involved with it, um, but it uh, epitomizes everything that he was trying to do in the city. Um, there is a very strict segregation of the residential blocks along the wings of the giant bird-like figure um, from the administrative, uh, from the ritual, from the governmental, bless you, uh, from the manufacturing. And, and what we know about Brasilia is, is that um, this order, again, is entirely bound up in, in a master aesthetic of place. And even more interestingly, a master aesthetic of place that is not evident to anybody experiencing the city on the ground. A master aesthetic, you know, Brasilia only makes the image of a giant bird of prey if you're looking at it from above. And what's really interesting is that it's only within the last several years that most people have had this capability, this God's eye ability to look at a city from above. Now we have Google Maps, we have Google Earth, we can arbitrarily see this kind of image of a city simply by zooming out. But for most of the 20th century, um, it was only in the plans that uh, were hung on the wall of the mayor or of the city manager or of the designer um, in which this optical order became apparent. And, and going back to James C. Scott, you know, and, and his contention that this is just one of two major ways of doing things. This is something that he characterizes as watchfulness from above. Very, very much about vision. Very much literally about the optical. And Scott goes on to say that this kind of bottom-down imposition of order, excuse me, uh, top-down imposition of order in the optical register um, about watchfulness is primarily consecrated to the needs of managing places. It's consecrated to the needs of administrating a place. It has nothing to do with the needs of the people who live there. And there's a fair amount of justice to this, this thought. Um, it, Corbusian high modernist urbanism and urban planning uh, matured in the world roughly at the same time as something called optimum control theory, which comes out of the operations analysis and systems research work that was being done uh, in, in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s with the advent of the first widely accessible computational platforms that allowed people to do uh, significant amounts of number crunching. Optimum control theory is a really interesting body of, of work in that it's extremely appealing, but it happens to be almost completely wrong. Um, optimum control theory is the idea that for any complex human situation, there is one and only one correct answer to this, and you approach that answer algorithmically. So, for example, if I wanted to plan an optimum city, and I needed to know uh, how much square footage of, of retail space that city needed. Optimum control theory would suggest to me that all I needed to do to derive that value would be to know how many people lived in the city, what is the population of the city, and what is their approximate level of disposable income, how much money can they spend in a given year. And if I have these two quantities, I can plug them into a formula which will algorithmically determine for me the amount of space in the city that I need to devote to retail. Well, this takes account of just about nothing important. But for a certain cast of mind, and particularly for a certain cast of administrative mind, it's an extremely compelling way of seeing the world. It manages to wave a magic wand at all of the very vexing problems of cities. I mean, cities which are, yes, they are. They're very, very dense environments. They're, they're environments that are inherently conflictual, that are inherently contested, that are not clean and orderly in the way that a scientist might like them to be. Not you know, you cannot start from zero and run the clock from zero. Um, so optimum control theory is a very, very uh, seductive way of looking at things if you're of a particular cast of mind. And between the optical order and the, the optical aesthetics of the high modernist top-down city and this notion of optimum control theory, you wind up with a, a, a way of placemaking that's consonant with those values. So for example, you'll get things like in Brasilia, there are streets that have names like Residential Access Way L1. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds to us kind of like a, a cheap dystopian movie, you know, the kind of 1970s dystopian movie where everybody wears silver jumpsuits and takes their meals through pills. You know, I live on Residential Access Way L1. 
Uh, as it turns out, this is not a mode of placemaking that, again, by far the great majority of people are comfortable with or, or which resonates with them. I mean, there's a reason why the streets of most cities in the world are named after culture heroes or are named after species of trees that are native to that place or, or have ways that resonate with local culture and practice. There's nothing for people to grab onto in this. There's nothing that's reflective of one's own identity or sense of self in this. And <clears throat> although I personally wouldn't mind particularly living on residential access way, although it is certainly the case that in Brasilia, where this was tried, um, those names were soon enough overwritten by folk names, by names that people gave the streets themselves, because this simply did not accord with their vision of, of who they were or where they wanted to live. As a matter of fact, Brasilia itself, as planned, was an extraordinary failure. And it wasn't until informal settlements of the workers who made Brasilia, who physically built Brasilia, but who were not allowed to live there, until informal settlements of the workers who built Brasilia filled in the space between the wings, the city itself never cohered. So it's really, really interesting to empirically look at the trajectory of the city over time and realize that this top-down imposition of order, whatever else it might be, is not sufficient to draw a whole picture. And Scott recognizes this. Scott says that there's this other complete tradition of placemaking and, and of understanding the ways in which human cultures uh, settle and inhabit a space. And, and he associates it with this woman, one of my intellectual heroes, uh, the great American urbanist Jane Jacobs. Here she is uh, in a bar in a tavern called The White Horse uh, in, in the West Village of New York City. Here's Jane uh, riding her beloved bicycle down the cobblestone streets of the West Village. And Jacobs' um, thinking about cities was encapsulated in her very first book, an amazing book which I recommend to you. You'll have to forgive the American in the title. It's still applicable to many, many contexts, not merely the American. The, the book is called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. It's written in 1961, and it posits a completely different mode of placemaking an urban experience. Scott calls this um, spontaneous order from below. Well, what does that mean? Uh, Jacob spends the great middle portion of her book discussing things like the uses of sidewalks and the, the precise mixture of activities on a city street that gives rise to a sense of place. But more than a sense of place, she'll specifically talk about how the use of a place makes it safe. This is her example of spontaneous order from below. This is her case study in what she calls natural surveillance or eyes on the street. Um, in the West Village that she was so much a part of, the, the, the West Greenwich Village neighborhood of New York City in 1961, um, whether by design or by accident, it was a mixed income neighborhood, it was a mixed use neighborhood, it was uh, a very diverse neighborhood where there, there were a whole lot of different functions all coexisting in the same place. There was some light manufacturing, some light commercial, some retail, and some residential. And what wound up happening as a result of that was that there was constant movement through most streets of the West Village because of the differing kinds of schedules each one of these land uses implied. So, you know, a, a, light, um, a light manufacturing concern might have people coming in in the morning and leaving in the evening, whereas the residential obviously would have people leaving in the morning and coming back in the evening. The, the mixture of retail and, and uh, services that were dedicated to the people who, who worked in the, the commercial operations meant that for a very, very wide extent of the day, there was a light amount of traffic on the street. There, there wasn't this kind of like crush hour twice during the day, but abandoned the rest of the time dynamic that we see in a lot of single use urban places. There was a lot of um, people coming and going through most of the day. But importantly too, these were different kinds of people. <laughs> They made between them a fabric, a mesh of different kinds of uses of the place, different ways of approaching the district and its texture. And it turns out that this was enough, just barely enough, just barely past the threshold, to create a sense of the, of the network that made the community, that made the neighborhood what it was, and all the people who lived and worked in this place. And this mesh had a vital protective function. Jacobs tells the story of uh, a man who drove a car down the street that she lived on 
uh, apparently with the intention of abducting a young girl. There was a young girl that was playing on the sidewalk. Uh, a stranger pulls up in a car, opens his door, beckons to the girl, calls her over, she comes to the car. Um, in any other neighborhood, this might have been a statistic. You know, that, that girl might have been abducted and kidnapped and God knows what happened to her. But on the street that Jacobs lived, because of this really unusual mixture of different kinds of use and different physical uses of the place and different schedules, there were enough relations operating in the street, there were enough people physically passing through the street and moving in and out of the buildings around it, that when this man drove his car into the block, First, the butcher shows up at the door of the butcher shop, and, and uh, the, the, the mailman stops in his rounds, and uh, the daycare woman comes to the window and looks down on the street, and they all noticed that there were other people noticing. I mean, this, is some, this is a human faculty we have. If, if we're all walking down the street and we see that all of the people we see are looking in the same direction, we look there too. This is something that is sort of a property of, of groups. Um, and this, it was precisely this organic ability of the community to organize and regulate itself, even below the level of consciousness, that protected the girl in this anecdote. Because enough people came to their doors, came to their windows, that ultimately the stranger in the car became aware of it. And, you know, he backed off. Whatever, whatever ill intention, whatever evil plan he had in mind, he got back in his car, he closed the door, he drove away. And Jacobs calls this... Um, you know, the, the, the natural surveillance, the ability of the street to manage itself. It's not policed. It's not a security that's brought to it by either a public or a private security force. It's not a security that's imposed on by CCTV cameras. It's a sense of security and an ability to heal itself that arises precisely out of everything that Corbusier wanted to, to whisk away with a broom. Precisely out of all that messy history precisely on the tenure of people in that neighborhood. And their very, very delicately negotiated threshold of intimacy with one another. It was not that this was one big happy family, not at all. Because that mightn't have worked in quite the same way. It was that there was a very delicately maintained balance of people who only knew each other a little bit at what Irving Goffman calls the knob line. People that you recognize, you see them every day, but you might not even know their name. This is precisely the kind of relation that forms an organic shield against the kind of exploit that this man apparently tried to intend. This is a kind of order that is built up over time by an infinity of small acts. The order arises from the bottom. Nobody necessarily has the security of the street in mind. They're just walking down the street. But the fact that they're walking down the street means that there's a reason for somebody to be in a window watching them. And the fact that there's somebody in a window watching them means that there's something of interest for the person in the doorway across the street to attend to. This is the kind of fabric of small selfish acts that combines into an emergent order. And it is functionally superior to the top-down imposed model. Anna Minton, uh, a British researcher in a book that was written, uh, I guess, three years ago now. So it's another wonderful book. It's called... Ground Control, Technology and Happiness in the 21st Century City. Uh, she again has empirical evidence that, that uh, CCTV actually makes communities less safe. And, and her argument is this, and this argument is borne out by the facts. Um, when there is a community of the type that Jane Jacobs describes, there is this sort of fabric of relations. When you do the simple, when you take the simple expedient of placing a CCTV camera on that sidewalk, looking into the street. And the thought is that that camera will observe this street and make it safer, make it harder for criminals to do what they do. Do you know what happens? What happens is that the people living in that street no longer take responsibility for the life of their environment. They no longer engage with each other in the same way. They disengage. They say, <clears throat> well, there's got to be somebody on the other end of that camera, probably in a uniform somebody whose job it is to watch over us. So, you know, if they see, you know, two teenagers hassling an elderly person, before they might have intervened, they might have stepped up, they might have said, this looks like a mugging that's about to happen, and I don't want that on my street. They might have physically, or, or even sort of uh, para-physically intervened in that circumstance somehow. But when there's the camera on that incident, the idea is that, no, the cops are watching, somebody else will take care of it, I don't have to. 
when an elderly woman slips on the ice and falls and audibly cracks her hip bone, when there's a CCTV camera there, people don't rush over to pick her up. They don't involve themselves.